Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, or TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Catherine McLean, a tobacco control researcher at Temple University. TOPS is being organized by myself, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, C. Shang from The Ohio State University, and Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will now turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, to introduce our speaker. Today, Dr. Armando Meyer will lead a single paper presentation entitled Tobacco Sales Prohibition and Teen Smoking. Dr. Meyer recently joined the University of Lausanne in Switzerland as a senior research fellow, having completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Chicago. He received a PhD in economics from the University of Basel. He's published on a variety of topics in the fields of labor economics, health economics, and behavioral economics, including a series of papers on how emotions affect decision-making, how self-control problems with eating can reduce well-being, how medical guidelines affect physician behavior, and how pro-social individuals have adopted better health behaviors during the COVID-19 pandemic. He's among the top 10% of authors on the Social Science Research Network by total, total new downloads over the last 12 months. Our discussant today is C. Shang. Dr. Meyer will be presenting his research in three segments and we'll have pauses after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Meyer, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here and to have the opportunity to present this project. Now, in this project, we're interested in the question of whether tobacco sales prohibition affects teen smoking. This is joint work together with Ray Oldermott and Alois Stutzer, both at the University of Basel. So before getting started, just uh, giving a short disclosure statement here, the funding uh, sources that we had for this project were coming from the University of Basel and the Swiss National Science Foundation, we have never received funding at any point from tobacco company or advocacy organizations also outside of the context of this um, project. Now, other uh, researchers are more than welcome to apply for access to the data sources that we use. So these are available for other researchers as well. And we are happy to share our code to permit replication. Now, that said, um, I would like to start with the topic of today's talk. So we know that smokers start as teenagers. Most smokers start when they're between the ages of 14 to 20 years old. And um, what the blue line shows here is basically the age of um, when people become adults at the age of 18. And we see that most people start around the ages 14 to 18. So, when we think about how can we reduce smoking behavior in the long run, we need to tackle the question of when people started. And as we see here, most people start when they are teenagers. So potentially the policy lever of tackling teenage smoking could be very big. So having a policy that reduces teenage smoking might lead to large long run consequences on smoking behavior. And I guess that's one of the main reasons why the World Health Organization's Convention on Tobacco Control in 2003 um, states that each party shall prohibit the sales of tobacco products to persons under the age set by national law or 18. So clearly the World Health Organization wants to target these potentially young smokers to prevent later smoking. And not just the World Health Organization thinks that these sales bans are highly effective, also, when you, when you ask, actually survey uh, health policy officials, and we did this, all of them say that you know tobacco sales bans decrease smoking prevalence. And in our specific sample, 
a large share of people said that they expect a reduction that's larger than five percentage points. So that means, for example, if there is a 20% smoking rate among teenagers, they expect that it would be reduced up, up to uh, 15%. So going down from 20% to 15% by 5%. So this slide is to say that, you know, the, the effects that are expected from these laws are very big. So people think that these laws are highly effective. Now, of course, a question when, when we look at these laws, or when we look at, you know, the prescriptions from the World Health Organization that emerges is, apparently people think these laws work very well, but the question is, um, why would they? And this is what I will try to discuss on this slide. So the question is, do we expect sales bans to work? And there are different factors that play into these into this ev evaluation. On the one hand, we expect that demand might be reduced when you make it harder for teenagers to get cigarettes. So you increase the cost um, of, of getting cigarettes for teens, cost being very broad here in terms of, you know, having uh, uh, to go to a different place to buy cigarettes or asking your friends to get cigarettes and so on. So it's, it gets harder for teenagers to get cigarettes. Another function that a sales ban might have is it might affect the way cigarettes are perceived. So it might be that teenagers, after learning that a sales ban is in place, might update their beliefs about how dangerous it is to smoke. So there could be an expressive function of the law showing teenagers that smoking is dangerous. So this could also lead to a reduction in smoking prevalence. So the first two factors could lead to a reduction in smoking prevalence, but then uh, there might be counteracting forces and one um, specific mechanism that has been discussed a lot in the literature but that we don't have much evidence on uh, that directly sort of is linked to policy is the forbidden fruit effect. And the forbidden fruit effect is simply put that teenagers might find it more attractive to smoke when it gets um, more illegal in a way to smoke. And this effect could even lead to teenagers smoking more after the introduction of a sales ban because it's now cooler to smoke or, uh, you know, smokers are being perceived as more attractive and more risk taking. And this is something that could potentially counteract the impact on costs and information. Last, teenagers might attempt to circumvent the law by, for instance, instead of getting cigarettes from stores, getting them from friends or family. These are four key considerations when we think about the effectiveness of salesmen and how tobacco legislation generally could affect smoking behavior. Now, what we do in this specific project is we test all of these arguments and we um, also provide a comprehensive policy evaluation of the impact of tobacco sales bans on teen smoking prevalence. Of course, uh, we're not the first to think about tobacco regulation. Uh, it's a huge field as this online policy seminar demonstrates. Um, so just give, let me sort of, you know, take, make some pointers here. Um, so smoking bans and smoking uh, have been looked at extensively. There is a large literature looking at the effectiveness of smoking um, when, it comes to in when it comes to reducing smoking prevalence. There is also a large literature looking at taxes and teen smoking. And there is a smaller literature, but there, are, there is some evidence on sales bans and teen smoking. Uh, I, I'll sort of you know, summarize this literature very briefly here, but I would say that there are two main strands of literature within the literature looking at how sales bans affect teen smoking. One is looking at before and after comparisons on, con on the country level. So researchers have looked at how does smoking develop before the introduction of a sales ban and how does smoking develop among teens after the introduction of a sales. Now we all know that in tendency, smoking rates have been decreasing in um, developed countries. So doing this comparison will make it very uh, favorable for tobacco sales bans because of course we have a decrease in smoking prevalence over time. And when you just look at smoking rates before and after an introduction of a sales ban, it will look as if the smoking rate was greatly reduced, but this does not necessarily need to be the cause of the introduction of a sales ban, but could be traced back to general declines in smoking behavior. 
So in, a, in other words, there is no control group here. We just look at the before and after compared. Then there is quite some literature looking at policy mix in the US across US states. So for example, um, indices that have been used here are comprised policies such as advertisement restrictions or packaging restrictions, as well as access restrictions, making it hard to understand whether tobacco sales bans per se affect smoking behavior because correlating these indices with smoking prevalence gives us some overview of like how tobacco regulation can shape youth smoking, but we don't know which of the components of this index uh, indices really matter. So in that sense, there, there are a couple of open questions here. One is what exactly are the drivers that might affect um, tobacco, that might affect the, the impact on teenage smoking of tobacco regulation more generally. So we don't know, is it sales bans, is it uh, packaging laws? And we really go into detail here looking at sales bans specifically. And then uh, previous research also does look at these before and after comparisons, but doesn't really have a control group. So what we exploit here is a natural experiment which offers such a control group. Armando, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to just jump in really quickly. There's a question about how do you define a sales ban and what policy is it exactly? And is it the same as a, a, a legal age of sale? If you don't yeah. mind, just define that. That's a good question. So in our context specifically, a sales ban means that you are not allowed as a shop owner to sell cigarettes to children below or to teenagers below the age of 18 or 16. So these are the two minimum ages in the context that we will be looking at. And so the sale, sales span here is really a restriction on the sales of tobacco. It's not equivalent to a minimum legal smoking age uh, where you know, you're not allowed to smoke uh, below a certain age. So this is really focused on sales spans here rather than on uh, minimum smoking ages. But we do have evidence also within this project on minimum smoking ages uh, that I, I'm happy to talk about later. So what we now use is, is variation in these sales bands. And the way we go about this is, uh, or, or I think one thing that, or some features of our setting are really that we have a well-defined policy change of this introduction of sales bands that prohibit the sale of tobacco to teenagers below a certain age. We use uh, differences in regional introduction uh, timing to compare uh, regions that introduced the smoking ban, uh, the sales bans earlier, the regions that introduced it later, and regions that didn't introduce it at all. So these are our controls here. And then we uh, look at the setting where we have homogenous taxes. So across all regions here, uh, the tax level is the same. So taxes are not changing. The only thing that changes is whether a sales ban is in place or not. And then we're looking at the setting with a high smoking probability of around 20%, so these policies could actually have some bite. Now, what is the setting that we're talking about? In the main part of the analysis, I will focus on the analysis that we have for Switzerland, but we also conduct similar analysis for the European Union, and I will also show you the results for those. Now, the attractive part about the Swiss setting specifically is that we have different regional units um, that you know, can impose laws uh, basically uh, independently when it comes uh, to tobacco sales prohibition. So this is a map of Switzerland in 2005. And we have different cantons that you, these are the areas you see on the figure. And at this point in time, the URA, it was legal for uh, any teenager of any age to buy cigarettes basically, or uh, you know, even in, in principle for children. So now what we see what happens is cantons start introducing minimum sales age, which is either 16 or 18 over time. And this is exactly this variation that we use like across time and across regions. So in 2006, we see that some cantons start introducing laws, cantons being regions equivalent to the US states in terms of their, their fiscal power. Um, so we see over time, different cantons introducing these laws until it, at the end of our uh, sample period in, in 2016, there were three cantons left that didn't introduce the laws. We use uh, two types of data sets for Switzerland. So we have quarterly repeated cross-section uh, data for Switzerland from the years 2001 to 2016 with roughly 
170,000 observations here. And we, I'll focus throughout the talk on three outcomes, smoking status, attitudes towards smoking, and purchasing behavior, but we do have more uh, variables here, and I'm happy to talk about them if there are any questions regarding those. Uh, in addition, we have a data set that allows us to look, to zoom in on the even younger ones uh, on uh, teenagers aged 11 to 15 years of age for uh, four survey waves, 2002 to 2014, where we have roughly 60,000 observation in the health behavior in school aged children data set. Uh, due to data limitations, we only have a subset of answers here. Now we have information on smoke status and also on uh, the age of first puff. So, you know, when teenagers try their first um, cigarette, and I think this is particularly important for this age group because this might be a very important margin of behavior here. These are the two data sets for Switzerland where we use this regional variation across regions, across cantons within Switzerland. Then we have data from the European Union where we have introductions or increases of minimum ages um, across European Union states from the 1990s to 2012. Um, we have data here on 32 countries yielding roughly 140,000 observations. Again, we have information on the smoking status, or this is information that we will focus uh, during the presentation on. So, um, as I've already pointed out, sort of the whole idea of our empirical strategy or our, our uh, data analysis here is that we have different regional units that introduce the same law or a similar law at different points in time and we compare early introducers to later introducers and never introducers basically so these are these are these are the control group here um, now how do we put that into action so we have as a dependent variable we have an indicator variable which is one if you're a smoker and zero otherwise and we use uh, linear regressions to do this analysis so we have a one variable which captures whether you're currently subject to a ban or not. So binding sales ban is one. For example, if you are 17 and live in a canton with a minimum sales age of 18. It would be zero if you're 17 and live in a minimum sales age uh, in a canton with a minimum sales age of 16, because then you're not subject to the ban anymore. So you're not under a binding sales ban because now you can access cigarettes. And then we have an indicator variable, which is sales span, which is one if a canton has a sales span for all people and zero otherwise. So uh, when, when you're 20 and there is a sales span in place in your canton, then this would be one and it's zero otherwise. And what we're interested in here really is the binding sales span. So how do sales span affect teenagers that are really currently subject to the restrictions? So for example, a 16 year old living in a canton with a minimum sales age of 18. And we adjust for differences in demographics and uh, smoking rates across uh, cantons and age groups. So we include, we basically absorb average smoking rates across each specific age group here in, in, in the statistical specification. And then we have also age group specific canton fixed effects, which means basically that we take out differences in average smoking rates within cantons across age groups. Uh, we also include age group specific year fixed effects. Um, so what this means is basically we take into account that there might be different trends in smoking rates across age groups over time and we want to account for this. So we make all of these adjustments but I can tell you it doesn't matter whether we do this adjustment or not the results are equivalent. Then uh, we uh, use individual level controls uh, to account for determinants of smoking, like whether uh, you're male or female, foreigner, a household size, dummies, a uh, physician density, as well as youth and general unemployment. And we allow for uh, dependencies or like, um, because we have the treatment in a way, the binding sales span, this introduction on the cantonal level, we uh, uh, take this into account when we calculate the standard errors by clustering the standard errors on 26. This is the empirical strategy that we use. So we really sort of, uh, you know, uh, move away from individual level differences at the cantonal level. So these levels all don't matter. We really look at whether the introduction of a sales span leads a canton to deviate from their previous trend. 
when compared to cantons that did not introduce a sales ban. Now, one key assumption for this empirical strategy to work is that sales that cantons that introduce sales bans and cantons that don't introduce sales bans or cantons that introduce sales bans later are on similar trajectories with respect to their smoking trends before introducing a sales ban. And this is what we, uh, you know, in rough terms checked on this figure. So we see that in 2006, the first sales bans were introduced. And we sh I show you two lines here. The black solid line is the line that indicates the uh, smoking rates among teenagers for cantons that ended up introducing a sales ban. And the black dash line is the uh, smoking rate for cantons that did not end up introducing a sales ban. And what we want to see here is that cantons that did not end up introducing a sales ban and cantons that did end up introducing a sales ban had similar trends with respect to smoking rates before the introduction. And this is roughly what we see here on this figure. So they, they differ in the level, but they don't differ in terms of the trajectory. So before 2006, these cantons developed in parallel in terms of their smoking rates, which suggests that our empirical strategy here uh, is valid. So with this in mind, I would like to uh, um, come forward to, to the first um, Q&A session. Great, thank you. Uh, so I think I will let C, our discussant, uh, take first crack at any yeah. questions. Yes, uh, thank you. I have a few, I would call clarification questions. The first one uh, is uh, how you define being a smoker. Because we know that in the literature and also we, we all understand that uh, teens and youth in general, they're experimenting with smoking. So um, we need to be very careful with defining the smoking status. So whether they are occasional smokers, uh, whether they are weekly or daily smokers, and can you say a little bit more about how you define the smoking status, which is your uh, primary outcome? Yes. So for the data for Switzerland, we'll, which will be basically most results that I will show you, the question is, do you smoke even if only rarely so? So this is the question that we use for the data for uh, the teenagers that are a little bit older, between um, 12 and 18 from the tobacco and addiction monitoring. And then we also have a question for the younger teens between 11 to 15, where it's asked how often they smoke per week. And there, is an op there was an answer option for them to say that they, are not, that they don't smoke. Uh, and there we use this kind of categorization between non-smokers and people that smoke, even if they only smoke uh, once per week. Um, in addition, we have outcomes that allow us to look at this more fine-grained by looking at, for example, the age when a teenager first smoked. Um, so even just try smoking. So we're really going uh, basically to smoke, like whether someone is a smoker or not, is here quite broadly defined in terms of someone that even just rarely smokes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and another question uh, regarding the uh, policy environment. So um, in the US literature, we also care about a lot about the school level policies. Can you say a little bit about uh, this? Because we think that may also uh, could be an important control in your, in your specification. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have uh, school level policy data, but it would be interesting uh, to add it. Okay. Based uh, on the institutional context, we, we don't know of any big changes that were sort of concurrent at the cantonal level with the introduction of the sales. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, and I think the last clarific question, clarification question is regarding the um, minimum age sales. Uh, you mentioned you're like 16 or 18. Um, can you say a little bit more about uh, the uh, prevalence? And I wouldn't call, I wouldn't call it prevalence, but the shares of uh, the regions uh, that implement different uh, age sales laws? Yes. So in Switzerland, it's roughly 50-50. So um, roughly 50% of the regions introduced um, a minimum sales age of 16 and roughly um, the older half introduced a minimum age of 18. So it's uh, 12 and 11 cantons respectively for each of the minimum sales age. Okay, so uh, here comes my last question. So I know that uh, the tobacco and addiction survey uh, covers all ages. Um, 
So just wondering if you're going to use the entire sample or just a sample of teenagers and uh, young adults. Yes. So the analysis I will show you will use the whole sample, but I can tell you that when we drop uh, individuals that are above the minimum sales age in their respective canton, or you know, are above age 18 or 20, the results look equivalent. So it doesn't matter how we restrict the sample here. Thank you. Right. And yeah, I, I just have uh, one more, sorry, uh, did you have something else to say, Armando? No, no, go ahead. There, there's uh, several questions around uh, compliance and enforcement, and I'm wondering what are the penalties to sellers? And uh, you know, are, are they large enough to discourage smoking? And uh, is there anything known about whether uh, these fines are actually assessed to retailers? Who, yeah, who that's violate? a very good point. Yeah. Um, I will go into more detail regarding enforcement so I don't think that uh, these sales spans here are extremely strictly enforced, but they are enforced enough so that you know, people actually change their behavior, uh, which is uh, what I will show uh, toward the end of the talk uh, in terms of purchasing behavior. Um, we do know that for uh, shop owners, it can be up to a $40,000 fine if they illegally sell uh, cigarettes to teenagers. Okay. And are you, do you know anything about whether they're actually assessed? Yes. So they are assessed regularly at the cantonal level and there are huge differences in the regularity and the start of these assessments, which is something that we will also exploit in the empirical, anal empirical analysis, which we also have data on. So we, we surveyed basically the cantons and asked them with which incidents they did test, test purchases, what the results were. And um, I, I can talk much more about this. Um, later on as well. Okay, well, why don't you keep going and, and we'll pause later for more questions. Great, thank you. So um, I, I've, I've sort of, as I've said um, earlier on, we look at these regional differences in the introduction timing of these sales spans and make it illegal for shop owners to sell tobacco to certain age groups uh, in this specific age, in this specific case below the age of 18 or 16. Now it looks like these cantons developed pretty similarly before the introduction of sales spans in terms of smoking prevalence, which is reassuring. And what I show you now here is, I show you how the share of smoker develops depending on the distance to the introduction in, of these sales spans. So this figure gives you the average smoking prevalence depending on the distance or the cantons that ended up introducing the sales. So this is sort of a simple before and after comparison here. So we see that the share of smoker is decreasing throughout, but it's not particularly increasing uh, its decrease around the introduction of sales spans. So there is no inflection point in terms of smoking rates around this introduction. Um, so this figure is sort of in one figure summarizes what we find in this context here is that there is no big change in smoking rates because of the introduction of sales. Um, so this is it's, it's the main takeaway and the main figure to illustrate this. We look at, uh, at into this with more in more detail using the regression analysis that I pointed out just before. So this is uh, the table showing these results. So we have um, a lot of things going on in this table, um, but basically what you see here is two different data sets. So columns one and two are um, um, combine the data from the tobacco and addiction monitoring. And then columns three and four, we have the uh, data from the health behavior in school aged children survey for the pupils aged 11 to 15. And then uh, we have the controls and fixed effects that I mentioned. So those take out these, this cross-sectional variation in cantonal smoking rates. So they adjust for differences in smoking rates across cantons, across time and across the age groups. And now what we see in column one is that there is a roughly an 18% average smoking rate among teenagers in our sample. And we see that there is a reduction of 0.2 percentage point after the introduction of a sales span for the teenagers that are currently subject to the sales span. So um, to set this into relationship to the smoking rate of 18%, this is a less than 1.2% reduction in smoking prevalence among teenagers, according to this point estimate. However, um, uh, these as, this estimate is statistically insignificant, and one reason is exactly because the 
coefficient is, is very small. And we see the same holds true when we look, when we zoom in and just look at whether, you know, given that you're a smoker, how much do you smoke? Is this affected by the sales trend or not? This is the result in column two. And again, we don't see any a meaningful reduction here in the number of cigarettes smoked. And we can then go on and look at the 11 to 15 year olds, which might be in a way, uh, maybe even the more relevant age group, because this is when a lot of people start trying to smoke and start picking up smoking. But again, we don't see any uh, reduction here in smoking prevalence or a substantial increase in when you know, teenagers first experiment with smoking by having their very first cigarette, which, is, which are the results in column four. So across these different data sets, uh, we don't see that's much, that there is much happening after the introduction of sales. And this is clearly sort of in contrast with the expectations, I think that public health officials um, had here. And um, this is what this figure illustrates. So we surveyed um, health officials across Switzerland and asked them, and for most of them, this was a questionnaire that came well after the introduction of sales ban. We asked them what they thought how big the reduction was in smoking prevalence in percentage points that's attributable to the introduction of sales bans, and they expect roughly a five percentage point decrease. Now, what you see here, uh, the dots and, and the, the, uh, the black lines show you coefficient estimates and corresponding confident, confidence intervals across different specifications. And we see that basically, independent of the modeling assumptions that we make, we see that the coefficient estimates and the confidence intervals rule out that the effect sizes are as large as uh, the health officials expect. So in that sense, I think at the very least, what we can take away from these coefficient estimates is that people that were familiar with the context and that are experts in the field and, uh, and relevant uh, to introduce and to, to um, sort of check on these laws uh, expected the laws to be much more effective. In that sense, I think at least for the Swiss context, we need to update our beliefs about the effectiveness of these. Now we also look at uh, the European Union context, doing the same type of analysis using differences in production timing across countries within the European Union. And again, we don't see uh, any uh, meaningful decreases in smoking prevalence, uh, depending on whether you're currently subject to a sales ban. Uh, we also don't see anything going on at the intensive margin here in column two. So with that uh, in mind, so we've seen now across two settings, there's not much happening in terms of smoking rates. Um, we also you know, make sure that we, the way we do the analysis is, is proper by looking at whether it might, whether it's really true that these cannons develop different, uh, consistently or similarly in terms of smoking prevalence, comparing smoking trends in cantons that introduced laws earlier with cantons that introduced laws later with cantons that introduce different minimum ages and so on. We also check whether smoking rates maybe already reacted before a law was introduced, but we don't see any differences in, in that sense. Uh, we can also look whether there was demographic change after the introduction of sales bans um, that might actually have been caused even maybe by sales bans or might just have happened coincidentally. And we don't see anything changing in terms of the demographic makeup of the population exactly around the introduction timing of sales bans. We can also assess advertisement and smoking bans because um, some of those were introduced in Switzerland um, and we don't see much bite of these policies for teenagers and it does not affect our coefficient estimates for sales bans when we take those into account. It's also not the case that you know, certain regions drive these results. So these results are very consistent no matter which regions we consider. And um, one thing that I think is notable and uh, it's, it's interesting is that we, when we look across different social demographic characteristics and we didn't pre-specify these analyses, we see basically that there is no heterogeneities across these different uh, social demographics, but we do see that um, people from uh, parents or children from parents that have a rather lower educational background, uh, they seem to reduce smoking a bit. So in that sense, that's encouraging. We see that for, for this particular group of teenagers, there is a reduction in smoking prevalence. But otherwise, we don't see much happening here. So 
with that, I would like to come um, to the debate over prohibition. And I think we have another uh, question slot. Great. Um, See, uh, feel free to go ahead. Yeah. So I think uh, from my perspective, when I look at the table that you presented uh, using Swiss data, one thing I've been thinking is uh, whether you can restrict uh, the sample from a tobacco and addiction survey to just ages 14 to 15 because uh, that way you can utilize more variation over time and also looking at the uh, participants that would be uh, are impacted by uh, sales restrictions. So I don't know if you have done that and if you have, uh, why do you see different results there? We haven't restricted it to the age group that young. What we did do in terms of restricting it was to the future minimum uh, age that will be present in a canton. So we basically take out every teenager that's older than the minimum sales age in the canton and really only restrict it on people that either now or in the future will be subject to a sales ban and their defects look very similar. Yeah, I just think it would be a very interesting uh, check. And so you can also mm -hmm. present a similar sample side by side. And um, yeah, so that's uh, um, my first question. And I think uh, you also presented a table regarding the results from an analyzing EU data. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, uh, a little bit of uh, information would be, I think, useful to just uh, describe what EU countries' uh, current uh, uh, restrictions are in terms of um, ages for sale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so okay. Uh, just just to follow up shortly on the health like on this on this age group so actually what we did uh, is we restricted also to uh, below 16 year olds in the tobacco and addiction monitoring data to make it to make it homogenous with the um, health behavior in school age children data and the results were similar uh, mm -hmm. I forgot I forgot to say this uh, yeah. with respect to the to uh, the European Union context so of course, uh, in the European Union context, at the country level, there were sometimes different changes introduced alongside the sales bans, like for example, tax hikes or minimum smoking ages. So we can also look at minimum smoking ages and we do that in the paper and we don't see that, you know, minimum smoking ages in combination with sales bans are more effective at reducing smoking prevalence. In terms of minimum ages at this point, all the countries are at the minimum age of 18 that we're, uh, that we're looking into. Uh, but there were some countries, and we have quite some countries that introduced the minimum sales age from 16 to 18 during our sample period, which we also uh, take into account when we estimate these effects. Um, there were some countries that introduced sales bans before the 1990s when our data starts. So there were a few countries that, that introduced sales bans in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and of course, those we can't analyze. But the big uh, bulk of countries introduced these minimum sales ages after 1919, sometimes starting with 16 and sometimes right away uh, going to 18. Yeah, I guess, you know, um, my, I guess my uh, uh, interpretation of this is it could also be um, the reason that why you don't see significant results may also be the policy dose. So, for example, in the U.S., we raised the minimum age to uh, 21 um, recently. So it may be that age 16 uh, for the minimum age sales is um, not effective because uh, uh, still those uh, who are older than 16 can still purchase cigarettes. So if you sort of uh, distinguish between um, age 18 uh, versus age 16 cutoff, you may see a difference um, yes. in that case. Yeah, so we, we can do, make this distinction. So for Europe, uh, most countries uh, introduce the minimum age of 18, um, but we can look at whether minimum ages of 18 in the European context were more effective than minimum age is 16, and we don't see any differences there. When we look at the Swiss context, we do see that there was a larger smoking uh, prevalence reduction in the cantons with a minimum age of 18. Um, but I have to caution a little bit in terms of the interpretation of these effects. And the reason is that we also look at experience effects. So, you know, how does it affect your smoking behavior today if you in the past have been subject 
to a, a sales fan, uh, also depending on the age. So we can look at whether you're more likely to be a smoker today if in the past you experienced a sales ban with minimum age 18 or with minimum age 16. And we don't see any differential impacts there. And we also don't see any long run impacts in general of these sales bans. So at least in our sample, it's not the case that if you've experienced a sales ban, later on you will start smoking less. Um, and we sort of you know, had hoped maybe that this effect of the minimum sales age of 18 in the Swiss context would then sort of uh, spill over to long run smoking uh, behavior, but uh, we don't see this. So we do have a few, uh, a few questions. Um, so a couple of them are related to heterogeneity. Um, one is asking about heterogeneity by smoking intensity mm -hmm. uh, and, and whether you looked at that, whether the, the effects differ depending on um, the respondent's smoking intensity. Another is related to heterogeneity based on uh, the two-way fixed effects models within a Goodman-Bacon decomposition and whether you've looked at that to see whether the sort of, I guess, uh, Canton level effects sort of d differ widely. Yeah, great. Um, I mean, we cannot look directly at smoking intensity in terms of heterogeneity because we don't have panel data on the individual level. So we can't make an interaction between sort of ex ante smoking intensity and later on smoking behavior. Uh, so this is a, a limitation of our setting. Uh, we do look at how many cigarettes people smoke and we don't see uh, any effects there. We can also look at the nicotine intake, for example, or whether someone has smoked more than 100 cigarettes in their lifetime. And again, we don't see anything across these outcomes. Um, with respect to the um, Goodman-Bacon de decomposition, uh, so the application to, of Goodman-Bacon to this specific setting is not straightforward. And the reason is that we have basically triple differences uh, in differences setting here. Uh, so what we did is we looked at, you know, what happens when we drop each canton from the sample? Does this affect the coefficient estimates? That's not the case. Uh, the other thing that we did is what happens if we drop each canton year combination, which is basically a, sort of the, the closest we can get to what uh, Goodman-Bacon proposes for differences in differences in, in this triple differences in different setting. And we basically see uh, very similar results here. So there is no um, particular sensitivity to the region that's included in the sample. Okay, and there's one more uh, technical question about whether you've um, tried to look at small cluster approaches, like presumably uh, while bootstrap, um, to deal with the fact that there aren't that many um, cantons in, in your sample? Yes. Or, yes. or, con or countries in the, the EU sample? Yes, so we did this for uh, the analysis for Switzerland and the results were equivalent. Okay, and at the risk of uh, taking more of your time, there, there's a question more generally about um, whether your results imply that we shouldn't really be doing these bans because of the moral case for it, um, that uh, banning it, uh, cigarette sales might be, uh, you know, morally the right thing to do, and that uh, whether it speaks to the problem that, you know, that cigarettes are so widely available that um, that sort of gets at why uh, the, the ban might not be effective. Yeah, I think the second part definitely plays part in the response here, um, and I will get to it shortly. I think with respect to, uh, you know, the moral obligations of introducing these bans, I think, I think I would not argue against introducing these bans. I think it's good to have uh, these spans, but I think it's also important to highlight that they might be far less effective than we thought. And I think one aspect that comes into play here is that bans can also be uh, used in a way to say that, you know, we do everything to protect the population. So if they still end up smoking, it's their problem. And I think sometimes this justification is used in politics. Um, and, and in that sense, I think we have to be careful that these bans in a way do not act as uh, seemingly effective policies when they're not. So, I, so, so the way I see this contribution is really in stirring this discussion about, you know, what are, what are the appropriate tools uh, to try to reduce uh, smoking among teenagers. Okay, feel free to continue. Great. Um, yeah, thanks again for, for these questions. So now we'll go into a bit more detail with respect to the underlying mechanisms here. So there are different mechanisms that I, that I pointed out at the beginning. One is that it might be costlier now to get cigarettes. You know, it's harder to get them at the store. Um, so people might shift away from getting cigarettes at stores to getting them from friends or family. 
Um, this also goes together with point four here, circumvention. And then we have points two and three, which are about sort of the expressive function of the law, two uh, alluding to the fact that sometimes laws increase the information about the danger of something. So for example, here of smoking. So it could be that teenagers think that it's more dangerous to smoke after the say, introduction of salesmen than before. I think one thing that's really interesting here, at least from my point of view, is the forbidden fruit effect. So how do these policy affect the perceived attractiveness of smokers versus non-smokers? And could this be a reason for why we see a null effect? Because it could be that you know smoking gets more attractive after the introduction of sales bans, and we can look at this using attitudinal measures. So we'll go through each of these factors and discuss what we find. So now I will start out with uh, the effects on perceived danger and attitudes towards smokers. So we know that there is a large correlation between perceived dangers and attitudes towards smoking. So people that don't think it's dangerous to smoke are more likely to be smokers and the other way around. We see a similar pattern uh, when we look at attitudes towards smokers. So here we look at, we have different attitudinal measures in the data where people are asked, you know, who do you consider cooler? Uh, and people say, you know, whether they consider non-smokers cooler or smokers cooler. Um, and we see that in tendency, you know, if you think non if you think, think smokers are cooler, you tend to be more likely to be a smoker yourself. So these there are strong correlations between these attitudes and perceived danger and smoking. But the question now is, how do the sales bans affect these attitudes and the perceived danger? And this is what this table gets at. So here in columns one to three, you see the impact of the perceived appeal of smokers versus non-smokers. And in column four, you see the impact on the perceived danger of smoking. Now, what we see here is that if anything, smokers are perceived as being less cool and generally less attractive after the introduction of sales bans. And this is particularly true among smokers themselves. So my takeaway from columns one to three here is that, you know, being subject to a sales ban certainly does not lead to a pronounced forbidden fruit effect in the sense that smokers now are certainly uh, so suddenly perceived as much more attractive than non-smokers. Uh, we also don't see much going on for an effect on uh, the perceived danger of smoking. So neither attitudes nor perceived danger seem to change very much around the introduction of sales. Um, which leads me to circumvention. Now, uh, we've already talked about this, you know, enforcement plays a major role here. As I pointed out, I don't think that the enforcement here uh, was, uh, you know, extremely high. Um, and I will show you a bit more on this. So first we uh, can look at, you know, where do teenagers get cigarettes from when they, um, when they buy cigarettes themselves. So this graph shows you where teenagers get cigarettes from when they actually say that they buy them themselves. And most of them get them from kiosks. And kiosks are small corner stores where you can get cigarettes, sweets, and, and also cigarettes, uh, and also uh, newspapers and so on. So most of the people get uh, cigarettes from there. Now, what happens when it's, it gets harder uh, to uh, get cigarettes, which is uh, basically this, this um, figure. So we see that before, before sales plans were in place, of course, you could just walk into any kiosks and get cigarettes. Now afterwards, it gets a bit harder, but it's still possible. So we see that initially after the introduction, there were roughly when Cantons did these test purchases, so when they sent out sort of these uh, mystery shoppers, they saw that the teenagers could still uh, get cigarettes to some extent, but it, was cer it certainly did become uh, harder compared to before we see that the median uh, share of cigarettes sold in these um, test purchases were around 30%. And there is a huge heterogeneity across cantons, which we can also uh, use in the analysis. So what happens when it gets harder to, to get cigarettes, uh, you are more likely to switch from getting them uh, to buy, to switch from uh, buying them at stores to buying them from friends or family. So this figure shows you where people get cigarettes from when they don't buy cigarettes themselves. And we see that the overwhelming majority gets them from friends. So basically it is harder to get cigarettes and people switch away from getting cigarettes at stores to getting cigarettes from friends and family. This is also what this table shows you here in column one. 
So people switch away from buying cigarettes by themselves and get them instead from friends and family. Now, what's interesting on this slide is, you know, uh, we also look at, so it, it's harder to get cigarettes now. So who would we expect to be most affected by it being harder to get cigarettes? And what we look at here in columns four and five is we look at how prevalent it is or how common it is among your friends who smoke. And what we see is that if you have friends who smoke, there is no reduction in smoking prevalence that's shown in column four. Um, but if you have, if, if you do have, uh, if you don't have friends who smoke, so if you have peers who are non-smokers, there is actually a reduction in smoking prevalence. And one reason might be that if you don't have friends who are smokers, then it's just much harder to circumvent the ban and to get cigarettes from that from them. So to summarize these these, these findings on the slide. We see that people switch away from getting cigarettes at stores to getting cigarettes from friends or family. And we also see that peers that have, uh, that people that have peers who are smokers seem to have no problem to continue smoking, whereas people who have peers who are not smokers um, have reduced smoking prevalence, which might be because it's harder for them to access cigarettes. Uh, we look at uh, an array of further results looking exactly in detail at these test purchases, you know, exploiting that some cantons had test purchases much earlier with a much higher frequency than cantons uh, than other cantons. We can also see at whether the shares sold in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, test purchases failed basically across cantons. As Sorry, we, Armando, do you mind explaining what the test purchases are? Because some of our, I think, people yes. Uh, so this consists of mystery shoppers that are below the age um, that's uh, mandated in the canton. And they go to the um, kiosks, for example, and they try to buy cigarettes. And then, uh, you know, if they get cigarettes, uh, this kiosk has failed the test purchase, and it was a, sa uh, um, a sale that was not in accordance with the law. This is this is how it works, and and this, every canton decides basically when they do it, with what frequency do it, how many stores they cover, and so on. And we can use this heterogeneity, but we don't see that there is much going on. Uh, in terms of like, you know, in cantons where the test purchases are going very well and there's a very low share of, um, of, of sales that are not okay, uh, we don't see that the smoking reductions were bigger in those cantons. We can also look at minimum smoking ages. Again, as I said, uh, there's not much going on there either. And in some cantons, uh, you know, there were some uh, sort of like um, grace periods in place for uh, cantons to be able to update vending machines with an ID card reader. Uh, and we can take this into account in the analysis as well. But it's not the case that after this upgrade, suddenly the smoking rates drop. So um, this lag does not seem, this policy lag does not seem to play a big role here. We can also look at traveling. Um, you know, one way we do this is by just taking the distance to the next canton that has a lower minimum age, or by dropping cantons from the sample that have that have a neighboring country that has a, min a lower minimum uh, age. And uh, again, we don't see much happening here. Last, and I, I've already alluded to this, uh, there could be experience effects. So if, you know, maybe there is no contemporaneous effect on smoking behavior, but you sort of were raised in, the, in a way that smoking is bad. So once you're an adult, you smoke less just because you've been exposed to a sales ban, even though we don't see any immediate effects. Um, but that's not the case. So it's not the case that just having experienced the sales ban at a younger age, or like even the number of years you experience the sales ban matters for long run smoking. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, summarize. So there is small, if any, effect on smoking. There is no impact on perceived danger of smoking. There is also no evidence that's strikingly in favor of the forbidden fruit effect. If anything, we see evidence against it, which in a way is reassuring for you know, policies that target teens at least in the case of smoking uh, restrictions, it doesn't seem to be the case that by introducing restrictive policies, you make it more attractive for teens to smoke. Teen substitute sources, so these sales spans, they do have some bite. Teens substitute away from getting cigarettes at stores to getting cigarettes from friends and family. And what we see here, what I think is really quite interesting and what I find fascinating and also hope that in future research, um, uh, we can learn more about this, we only see reduction in smoking prevalence among people that have no peers who smoke. And this 
suggests that maybe peers act as gatekeepers. So usually we think about peer effects in terms of you know, smokers encouraging other people to smoke, but in this case, it might also have to do with peers acting as gatekeepers and sort of you know, providing the addictive goods is easier if you have peers who um, consume them. So with that, I would like to come back at the question in the very beginning, which was uh, what we set out with for this research project. And here was the, qu the question that we had was, does tobacco sales prohibition for teens reduce smoking? And our answer based on data from, the Euro from Europe and Switzerland suggests, unfortunately, not really. I do hope, however, that we really find some ways to tackle uh, teen smoking prevalence. And I'm looking forward to more questions and comments. Thank you. C, do you have any comments? Yeah, or I think uh, my final comment is that given uh, uh, your findings regarding uh, most of teens, they got cigarettes from their friends, uh, I think a more reasonable outcome would be uh, looking at how this uh, sales bans would impact daily smoking problems or weekly, at least weekly smoking problems. Because you imagine that this group, they are less likely to get uh, constant supply from their friends. Mm -hmm. So you may expect a, a larger impact of effective policy impact from that particular group rather than looking at just uh, uh, occasional smokers or those who reported they at least uh, smoked. So um, I just want to get your uh, comments regarding that and whether it's possible to look at this alternative smoking outcome. Yeah, so we, we also look at the, the amount of nicotine consumed, for example. Uh, we look at how often those teenagers in the health behavior and school age children survey smoke between the age of 11 to 15, where we know, you know how often they smoke in a week. Um, and uh, you know, across these outcomes, we don't see any big effects on, uh, on the incidence of, of smoking um, for, for smokers themselves. Um, can you also, if we have time, comment on um, what do you think will be effective uh, policies to reduce uh, smoking prevalence, at least uh, in Switzerland, because we do see a uh, trend that's going down over time. Yes. And I would just add, add to that uh, a related question is that there has been a movement toward Tobacco 21 in the US. Have there been some more efforts in Switzerland? Yeah, so across Switzerland and the European Union, there have been, as far as I know, no efforts to further increase the minimum age. The discussion that's happening in Switzerland at the moment is to have a uniform minimum age of 18. But at the moment, there is no debate about increasing it to uh, 21. Anything else? Say? Um, I think, yeah, just back to my uh, previous question regarding uh, since there is a trend that's going down, can you comment on what are the effective policies? Uh, so yeah, so, yeah, so based on previous literature, uh, I think some, some, th there is some ambiguity about what, what, what policies work. Um, I think sort of what's relatively consistently shown decreases, at least at some time periods in terms of smoking prevalence um, is tax increases. Um, but, uh, you know, we might not be entirely happy with tax increases since they are re regressive. Um, and we might not want to have this, um, you know, based on a normative uh, view. So, but if, if you're truly exclusively interested in, in reducing uh, tobacco um, consumption among teens, and based at least on my understanding of the literature, these are the most effective. Tax hikes are the most effective way. Um, very quickly, uh, someone says that your results on how people who have um, friends who smoke, uh, mm -hmm. th those being uh, different effects, um, is that consistent with the big decline in vaping in the US that was seen in the PATH study? Um, in 2020, um, the person posits that the Tobacco 21 law meant that many vapors at high school lost their peers and friends who smoke. And so is, is that yeah. consistent with what you're finding? I mean, it's, it, it certainly sounds consistent. I think one of the issues with, with this kind of analysis is that in, in our case, we know that smoking prevalence actually didn't change. So in that sense, maybe the peer groups were pretty stable um, uh, so they were, might not have been influenced by introduction of the tobacco sales bans. So 
but I think in general with these, these analyses and also in our case have to be taken with a grain of salt because it could be that sales bans in some way affect the peer composition um, and so it's hard to know uh, you know is it, is it the composition of peer that changes, changes or is it you know can we assume that the composition of peers stays fixed and it's really just about you know getting access to peers or not uh, so I think there needs to be more research on this, but it, it does sound consistent uh, with, with these findings. What we have. Okay, I think we're out of time. So Catherine, take it away. We are out of time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mir, for the presentation and to the moderator and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 90 people for your participation. I will be our next seminar speaker on December 4th, giving a presentation entitled the effects of e-cigarette taxes on e-cigarette prices and tobacco product sales, evidence from retail panel data. After leaving the seminar, you will be given an opportunity to complete a survey on your satisfaction with the seminar today. We appreciate the feedback. You will also receive an email with instructions for how you can receive a certificate for your attendance today. Thanks again for participating and have a top-notch weekend. <laughs>